I have to say that we're days away from finishing our preconceptual design report, and upon completion of that report, if you'll go to our website, you'll get a little more insight into what uh, the developments are with a little more detail than I can provide today. David LeBlanc, our president and CTO, would have loved to have been here today, but he's back in Ottawa writing the PCDR like crazy. So, without further ado, I'll tell you who Terrestrial are, where our technology has gone and where we're going. I'll talk about the business progress we've made over the last 12 months. And I'll talk about then our business plan, where we are today and where we're going uh, in terms of next steps. So first of all, Terrestrial Energy, we are a Canadian corporation incorporated in December 2012. Our mission is really simple, to be the first to market with a commercial molten salt reactor. Really simple, not really easy, as you can imagine. We have put together, I think, a pretty darn good corporate structure here. Our chair of our board of directors is Hugh McDermott, who used to be the president and CEO of uh, Atomic Energy Canada. So a very familiar name to a lot of people here. We have an executive team of uh, nine members. Um, we have an international advisory board, five members. The chair of our international advisory board is Tom Droulet, who was the uh, president and CEO of, it, of Ontario Hydro International. So another solid uh, fellow with great background. Now, what is a molten salt reactor? I would ask for a show of hands if you don't know what it is, but I'm guessing there will be very few folks in this room who don't, but in case, this is a breeder reactor, a molten salt breeder reactor, as opposed to a burner, which is what we're doing. Now, a breeder reactor or a burner, they have similar characteristics in that we have a typically graphite moderated core, and the fuel, the uranium thorium or plutonium, is blended in and dissolved in the salt fuel and melted down and operates at 700 degrees C, roughly, reactor outlet. And so the fuel circulates in the salt through the reactor core, generates the fission energy, and then goes off to heat exchange and ultimately possibly uh, steam generation leading to power generation. So that's very briefly what a molten salt reactor is. Is that a single liquid? Is that two or three liquids? This one, this one I showed you there had the two, had the uh, fuel and then the coolant salt. And that's pretty typical. But the breeder reactor is a different, a different species, again, because it has a, a core, and then outside of that, it breeds with other uh, materials. We are a burner reactor. Molten salt reactors, um, and our, our variation in particular, represent a great new paradigm in nuclear power for really four reasons in four dimensions. First of all, the safety characteristics are unprecedented. The molten salt reactors are intrinsically safe. We say that because they have a low temperature, sorry, a low pressure reactor. Uh, and that's because uh, there's no water in the core at all. So it's strictly molten salt operating at a very high temperature. So they are intrinsically safe. They have uh, passive decay heat removal as well, which bodes well for the safety case. Related to what I just mentioned, the cost of energy from these things is very uh, <coughs> competitive as well, excuse me. The capital cost to build one of these is, is very low compared to what you might be used to because the pressure is so low. So our reactor vessel may only be, say, an inch in thickness. And you would know what other light water reactor vessels are. The cost to produce energy is very low as well because the temperature is so high and the thermal efficiency then gets to be pretty high as well. So that keeps the cost of power and electricity down to a very, very competitive level. As well, the waste profile is very attractive. We can have a closed cycle for a burner reactor. Breeders, of course, can as well and do. So with the closed cycle on a burner reactor, the transuranic wastes are very, very small compared to uh, light water reactors and very, will be very attractive to society and the regulators. Fourthly, resource sustainability. We get a lot of power out of the fuel we put into our reactor and it's very competitive in, uh, in its cost performance. So that's the generic view of uh, molten salt reactors. Terrestrial has gone the next step and what we've done, we've taken the best of molten salt and we've simplified it as much as possible 
to make it uh, attractive to society, to the regulators, and to make it attractive to investors as well who want a simple reactor that looks saleable to the public and the regulators and is economic. So what have we done? This probably won't be a lot of news to a lot of people, but we sealed into the reactor vessel the moderator core, the graphite core, the primary heat exchangers, and the associated primary pumps. So that's all in one sealed vessel, sealed for the lifetime of the reactor. Now, I say lifetime because as you probably know, graphite has a well-known uh, tolerance for um, neutron uh, flux. And so after a certain period of time with uh, graphite and the neutron flux, it becomes distorted and no longer reliable as a core material. So in our case, we compensate for that by making reactors that will be replaced as a unit after a period of time, which I will not disclose today. But it's a very economical time period, if you like. We're not opening that reactor under any circumstances for repair. We build in uh, redundant capacity in pumps and heat exchangers. So if a heat exchanger does happen to leak, we can block it in, shut the pump down, and keep running at full power. As you can see, the bottom of the reactor vessel contains the graphite core. The top part is the heat exchanger, primary heat exchanger units with their integral little bowl pumps. And then above that would be the motors to drive those pumps. This is very similar to the smarter reactor Oak Ridge National Labs did, which was a salt-cooled reactor. We've gone the next step and put the fuel right into the salt. You can see the active reactor in the left-hand silo, and the right-hand side of the uh, silo bay has an alternate chamber for a new reactor core vessel. And so what happens at the end of run, we shut down the operating reactor, drop a new one into the right-hand chamber, connect it to the salt system, and go. Then we let the, uh, the formerly active reactor cool for a period of time, years, and then we take it out of that silo, drop it into the long-term storage cells. So a very tidy operation. The steam generation is, um, feeds a conventional steam-powered electrical generator system. We are planning for three different sizes of unit. So the smallest one will be 80 megawatts thermal, then we'll have a 300 megawatt thermal unit and a 600 megawatt thermal unit as well. With efficiencies in the order of 40 to 50 percent, you can see what the electrical <coughs> capacity would be. As I said earlier, it's been a great year of progress. Over the time, uh, over the last year, we've built our corporate governance structures. We now have over 24 people taking terrestrial energy into phase two of our program, and I'll talk about that phase in a minute. Uh, we are developing strategic relationships with government, industry, and the financial markets, as well as academic institutions. In the last year, we've confirmed our Neutronics case very comfortably. We've defined our heat exchanger and steam generator and pump options. And to the question of salts, we've taken a, man of, uh, sorry, a large uh, menu of choices and reduced it down somewhat to a smaller choice, a limited set. The choice of salts is a very interesting one because the salts have all kinds of different trade-offs between their neutronics performance and their thermal hydraulic performance. And being an integrated reactor, integral reactor, we've got to make everything work together. And that's, uh, that's fine, that's going to be happening and is happening in the uh, preconceptual design report, but to, to optimize we need to do more work. On the business side of things, our phase one funding round was completed and oversubscribed. We have started formalizing strategic partners and engaging with new ones. And we are engaged on those three fronts, as I've shown, Canada, the US, and the UK. We actually have a terrestrial member over in the UK doing very good work to get people there enthused about our technology. And they are very enthused. And by the way, I'll just point out the Canadian regulators, CNSC, are very open to small modular reactors and uh, very interested in hearing from us. We've talked to them on a preliminary basis. Our business plan, four phases. Phase one is nearly complete. It's days away from completion, actually. 
So the pre-conceptual design report will be done shortly. Then we move into phase two, the conceptual design phase, which will take a couple of years and result in um, a fairly detailed conceptual design report, followed by phase three, licensing and building one of these things. The one we build will likely be the IMSR 80, probably with power generation. Phases two and three will involve attracting investment and strategic partners as well, and we're into discussions on those fronts right now. Phase four, of course, commercialization. Can't wait. Current and next steps. So we're building the corporate governance structure to manage phase two, finalizing the preconceptual design report, engaging with uh, academic uh, partners, universities, both in the UK and, and in North America, and R&D partners as well. We're positioning the company for our next main round of funding coming up this summer. And we're looking for additional strategic and technical uh, partners. So bottom line, as John said and I said, we've got a lot of momentum behind this. This is going to happen. The policy environment, the capital and market environments are very positive for us. And phase two is about to commence. So we owe a great debt of gratitude to John and the Thorium Energy Alliance to Oak Ridge National Labs, to all the members of that facility in the past and present who have directly and indirectly contributed to where we are today, and to our shareholders and advocates, we owe a debt of gratitude as well for their support. That concludes what I have to say this morning. I hope I've enlightened you and would be happy for a couple of questions. Okay, can the graphite reactor core moderator catch fire? No. It's hard, it's hard to imagine how our, our reactor system could uh, devolve into a state where the graphite is exposed and uh, catches fire. I, I, it's a pool type reactor, so there are, there are no, penetra sorry, no penetrations in the reactor vessel. It operates uh, normally well under 100 psi, that's our best information at the moment. And so the case for graphite catching fire, I'd say, is pretty remote. The question was, in Canada, do we have the kind of regulatory roadblocks that you do in the U.S.? The answer, thankfully, uh, as my understanding uh, of the U.S. one is, is no. In the U.S., apparently the regs are all about you must have this, that, and that. In Canada, what they're telling us is you make the safety case and convince us that your reactor is safe and will not, uh, does not impose a, pose a threat to society. You figure out how to do that. You tell us what you need to make that happen. So it's very, very positive. Great question. Thank you. Has graphene been developed sufficiently for it to be a component in the heat exchange uh, portion of the design? Graphene. Ooh. We are not basing any of our technology on anything kind of too new at this point. We figure getting a molten salt reactor up and running will itself represent a great improvement in technology. Graphene may come into it, and we're looking at some other options for heat exchangers, but I can't comment on graphene. Uh, Absolutely. The question was, have we considered mining to be a strategic partner? Yes, sir, we certainly have. We're in contact with uh, a variety of folks on that, uh, that area. Sorry? Deep pockets will be good, yes. The first reactor... Are we publicly traded? No. No. So I, I apologize. You'll have to uh, assault Paul with your many, many questions. I'm sure it's uh, fascinating. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Don. Great.